Hello everyone. <coughs> Welcome to today's stream. My name is Ariana. I am the co-director of the Consent Academy, a Seattle-based nonprofit that aims to promote consent as part of everyday life. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you're having a good day. And I'm very excited to hang out today. Um, <laughs> welcome, Silly Millie. Welcome, Krellen. Uh, unfortunately, my brother's not here yet because there's so much understaffing at airports that he landed on time at his connecting flight airport in Paris. And uh, it took so long for he had to go through security. And it took him so long to get through that he missed his connecting flight. And the next flight doesn't leave until 9 p.m., which is rough because it's like a 12 hour layover in Paris. Um, so they rebooked his fight, flight for free, thankfully, thankfully, that's the, that's the, like, one bit of good in this, but, uh, I won't be able to hang out with him until tonight, so you all have to just meet him on Sunday. Um, but today we're gonna do what we normally do, um, play Stardew Valley, maybe. <laughs> hey, Aradin, uh, talk about community issues get into some deep things. I am also the one good thing about my brother coming a bit later is that I had more time to clean. <laughs> Got to go into the shower and really scrub deep all the corners and everything. Uh, it was overdue and then I had time to do that and a couple of other things. And uh, anyway, it's lovely to be here today. Uh, so Something that's been on my mind, total tangent. I don't quite understand the causality in the song Skater Boy, the Avril Lavigne song. Hi, Reverend Mort. It's kind of always bothered me, that song. Like, even when I was a kid, I didn't like it. Uh, so I get that the, the, like, spirit of the song, as we could say, is trying to talk about not being shallow that if you're shallow, that you judge a book based off of its cover, or you judge people based off of things that are incidental, that you may miss out on good relationships. But the thing that's always bothered me about it is the reference to the girl who rejects this boy in high school, right? So the main story of it is there's a girl in high school, she does ballet, she's kind of, a, kind of attracted to this guy, also in high school that she doesn't know, who's a bit of a punk. Uh, oh, thank you, an uncooked egg for the $5 tip. Much appreciated. So he is like a, a punk skater guy. And uh, she's kind of attracted to him. He's kind of attracted to her, but they don't date. Basically because she wants somebody who's a bit more part of her world. Um, which is a completely reasonable reason not to date someone. Like, there are tons of people in the world that I can be like, that person's hot, I would totally have sex with them, that I would not want to have a relationship with. If we are really different and incompatible in those ways, it doesn't make sense for us to be together, other than maybe a one-night stand or something, or like a fling. Um, and, uh, anyway... I don't get it because the thing that they reference later is that like in the future he becomes a rock star and she sees him on TV but they talk about how like basically she's alone with her child hi paladin hulk uh and that the father of her child has clearly abandoned them and there's like some implication of causality like if only she had been with this dude she rejected in high school um her life would be better. And it's kind of like, what? Like, what does her being a single mother have to do with anything? I don't understand it. I don't understand the causality here. And it feels like a little bit like they're blaming her. Like, oh, you made a bad choice and that's why so Reverend Martin, what did you say? Skater Boy isn't a love song or even a tragic love song. Skater Boy is ha ha suck up girl who thought she was better than me in high school is fat and sad now while I'm rich and famous song. 
only done through the proxy of the dude the singer is dating. Uh, because, yeah, exactly. You're, this is exactly it, Silly Millie, or not Silly Millie, Reverend Mort. And it says nothing about would this, as Silly Millie is bringing up, would this be a good relationship? Would he be a good parent? It has nothing to do with that. It's very much the, like, I'm going to enjoy someone else's bad fortune because they thought they were better than me in high school. And it's like, so let's say, for example, I had bullies. Starting in middle school, I had, oh, actually in elementary school, I had some pretty severe bullies. Like, I got bullied a lot as a kid. The first bully was, like, they all said, oh, he just likes you. It was really terrible. Like, he threw a big fire truck toy at my head and cut my head. He sat on me and peed one time. Like, this was, like, third grade. And um, he ended up getting held back, and then he really blamed me for it, and this encouraged bullying. And then I moved from that school when I was in fourth grade, moved to another school, uh, first day of school, I get beaten up because they don't like that my name's Ariana and someone else who's popular has the same name. And they're like, you're not allowed to have this name. Uh, I got bullied a lot. Like at a birthday party, this girl tried to break my fingers by slamming my hand in the door and then later slamming my ha hands in a window. Uh, like we had a pillow fight and she just used it as an opportunity to like repeatedly punch me. It was fourth grade, right? Uh, and she didn't like me. Because I, everybody asked me which boy I thought was cute in the class. And the boy I said happened to be this girl's boyfriend. And then later in high school, I got bullied more. I was regularly told to, like, you know, end my life. I was regularly told that I was scum, that I should die. Like, all of this stuff. Like, really heavily bullied. And most of those people... I'm, they've offended me on Facebook. I did not accept because I'm like, why the hell would I want to be your friend? Like you literally told me to die all the time in school. Like, why would I want to be your friend? But I see their lives and some of them are having good lives and some of them are still really struggling. My hometown where I grew up from sort of fourth, halfway through fourth grade on was very poor and uh, very, um, there's a lot of industrial waste sites there. Um, like it was pretty known that a lot of the squirrels and the rabbits had like severe mental deficits because of like groundwater poisoning and you weren't allowed to grow any food there and all this other stuff. And a lot of people that I went to high school with have died, like a very large percentage, either because they joined the military and they died in the military uh, opioid overdoses or cancers. I have several friends who've had like five different cancers. Okay. I don't get satisfaction from any of that. If I see the people who heavily bullied me as a kid and their lives are still difficult, I feel sad for them. I feel sad that like things did not get better. I feel sad that like you know, I hope that they grew as people. I hope that they got over whatever it was that made them a bully. Every once in a while, I've had people who bullied me or who were really unkind to me in school reach out to me to apologize. And I'm always kind of like, is this apology for you or is it for me? What's making you apologize to me now? And also, like, what are you doing to make sure your children don't become like that? Are you doing work to prevent this kind of bullying? Like that to me means you're really, like if you really feel sorry and you want to apologize to me, like volunteer for some anti-bullying charities or some shit, like that'll make me feel better. Raise your kids not to be bullies. Teach them about the harms of bullying um, or give me money. <laughs> I accept apologies in the form of cash as well. Uh, so that's usually what I say. But the song Skater Boy always made me sad. Like, I was kind of like, it's getting down on single mothers. It's getting down on people who do ballet. I did ballet. I was also a punk. You can do both. I did not like the false dichotomy of the two. And I don't like the idea of being like, when you were a child, you were a bit of an asshole. Therefore, I'm glad your life is shit as an adult. Where it's like, kids, it's rough to be a kid. And it doesn't, it doesn't forgive harms that you cause as a child I'm not going to go and say like oh you can just erase what like Brett Kavanaugh did simply because he was a teenager when he did it no absolutely not 
And yet, I'm not going to hold a child to the same level of onus and accountability that I would hold an adult to. Um, so yeah, I've been think I keep getting that that song stuck in my head. Uh, I don't know why because I never listened to it. Um, it upset me as a teenager. It still bothers me now. Um, I feel like it's just victim blaming and also like weird revenge fantasies. Uh, and exactly, Paladin Hulk. If she chose that boy, her child would be erased. Is that a positive? Uh, Krellen, you say the only reason the song gives for the ballet dancer not dating him was that her friends didn't like his clothes. Um, yeah. Hi, Deezer Braun, welcome. Uh, Silly Milia, apparently lots of people get off on others' misery. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your road trip to Tipron. Um, and, uh, Silly Milia, you say you're with me. I've never gotten pleasure from someone else's <laughs> suffering. Reverend Mark, quote, I accept apologies in the form of cash. Uh, always seems to upset my partners when they say they're sorry for eating the last piece of fried shrimp. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like you can, there are lots of ways to like take accountability to show you're sorry. Like to me, you just feeling guilty about it 20 years later or it's not 20 years. I'm not that old. Um, except for people who bullied me when I was like in elementary school. That was like 20 years ago. You can feel bad about it, sure, but like sitting there and feeling guilty, sure, the self-awareness, there's like part of me that's like, yes, I would like you to feel something in response to what you've done. But to me, that's like step zero towards accountability. Uh, what are you actually doing? You know, anyway. Reverend Mort, and while I do agree that the attitude of revenge fantasy are unhealthy, they're very understandable. There's a certain visceral emotional vindication in the idea of people who are mean to you suffering uh, in some sort of karmic retribution. Yes, and that's actually like a huge misunderstanding of the concept of karma. Uh, yeah, it's just not how the Buddhist concept of karma works. But anyway, uh... So what happens when you appropriate? So what was I gonna say? One of the other things is like, revenge fantasy, wanting people to suffer. So I, I, I want to create a term that's like the partner to victim blaming, because we like to blame people when bad things happen to them. But I also think we need a term for like, consequence wishing like when we wish for people to suffer consequences for things we feel they deserve consequences for and or punishment for um i agree with you silly millie the only thing i ever wonder is do you have any idea how much you've hurt me yeah and i mean like for sure i've moved on with my life i've gotten plenty of therapy but there are times in my life where like i think back to just how shit my childhood was. And I'm like, man, it makes me bummed out that a huge chunk of my life story is that I had a bad childhood. I mean, I had like a bit of a nervous breakdown about this when I was like 11. It was at my birthday party. I kind of freaked out. I was like, I'm so old. By the time I'm this old again, I'll be 22. That's like ancient. And like, what have I done with my life? I like really had a meltdown about this whole thing. And my parents were like, why, why, uh, why are you so upset about this? And I was like, I have accomplished nothing. But one of the other things that got into my head was that anything you do to somebody has been done to them forever. It's like forever written into the book of their life. Like the story of their life will always include this harmful thing you've done to them. And that like really affected me um, because I had birthday parties where, like, nobody really came. I, as a kid with any kind of disability, especially any sort of learning disability, I struggled really heavily with social norms and making friendships. It's a very classic story of being friendless. Um, and all of this really 
affected me. And I was kind of sad as a kid, knowing that so much of the story of my life was going to be one of like loneliness and struggling and suffering. And then Buddhism has helped me <laughs> with all of this because one of the core tenets of Buddhism is that life is suffering. And that's fine. <laughs> and that's helpful. Um, let's see. Okay, Reverend Mort, you said, uh, look, licensed Buddhist monk person, your technically correct understanding of karma has no place in this everyday conversation that uses the concept of karma in a culturally appropriated way. Yes, right? Like, but that's the, I only bring that up because people are like, yeah, karma's a bitch or whatever. And I'm like, oh, not exactly. It depends, on, also it depends on the lineage of Buddhism we're talking about, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, I understand that, like, modern, contemporary, Western usage of karma is pretty divorced from its cultural origin. Um, uh, Krellen, we want to believe in a just world because it allows us, and you've starred, we and us, to ignore the suffering of others and get on with life for given values of we and us. Yeah, I agree. Reverend Mort. Quote 22 is ancient. Thanks, 11-year-old Ariana, for making me feel old. Why would you think of me a person who will watch you talk about stuff on the internet 20 years from now? So inconsiderate. And it's, yeah, I mean, I don't actually think, I don't even think people in, like, their 70s or 80s are old. I feel like old is, like, a state of mind, really. <laughs> Hi, Ice Bunny. And also, like, something kind of controlled by your DNA that, you can't really help. Like, how fast does your body and different aspects of your body age? Anyway, my cat's on the bed. I would show you, except my room is an absolute mess right now. Uh, and he's just, like, sleepily staring at me. And it's very cute. Um, um, and there's a good... Um, one of Philosophy Tube's videos on punishment, and I think it's the one on capital punishment, uh, talks about, you know, different types of justice systems and, like, whether, like, you know, are we doing, like, an act utilitarian system? Like, Consent Academy's model is very about accountability is very act utilitarian in some senses. You could call it that, which is that uh, impact is more important than intent. And then also, if you're going to enforce any kind of consequences for someone's behavior, it has to actually be directly linked to the behavior and it has to be like reasonable. Now, please forgive the word reasonable, like that basically is the most abused word in legal systems in the world. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, what was I saying? What was I saying? Uh, yeah. But one of the things Philosophy Tube talks about is that sometimes we just feel certain people ought to be punished. And maybe we can feel like certain people sort of deserve to die. And part of me, I can relate to that. Like every once in a while, I think about people who caused a tremendous amount of harm in the world. And I'm like, yeah, this person shouldn't have the right to live here anymore. But then part of me is also like, but what about making people stick around to help clean up the mess they've made? Because I also feel like I don't like the, oh, I did a bad thing. I'm just going to wash myself of this and disappear into the ether and you'll never hear from me again. And it's like, okay, but are you going to help repair the damage you've done? Are you going to do it? Like just leaving doesn't necessarily help. Anyway, anyway. I had hair in my mouth. Uh... <laughs> Reverend Mort, my room is an absolute mess. Every person under the age of 45 and over the age of 20, welcome to life. Yes. And some of it's because, like, this room is technically our my office slash the guest room. But then we realized it doesn't actually make sense to make the guests stay in this room if I'd have to kick them out every time I work, which is every day. Uh, yeah, even Sundays and sometimes Saturdays. So we've been staying in here. 
but we don't have a proper wardrobe in here. So we had to take all the clothes and they just kind of become piles and it's, it's a whole thing. Uh, yeah. Ice Bunny, you said a sign of old is when you say back in the day when I was young and that, and then forget that the seventies and eighties had their own type of crap. Yeah, that's a good point. Silly Millie. Then again, I tend to hate that shift in most language from precise and usual, in my opinion, necessary meaning to a popularized meaning that makes it impossible to discuss the original precise meaning of the word. Yeah, I think that that's a, a common problem everywhere. Any any terminology will get eventually appropriated and watered down. It's very frustrating, like things like the words woke or identity politics. These are important concepts that were created by black people to talk about specific experiences related to racism and intersections of other marginalizations, intersectionality as well. It's not supposed, like the word intersectionality as it's used now has nothing to do with this actual sort of like intended origins and the conversation all of these things it's sad uh do you prefer the usage that docking's created for the word meme um silly millie Ugh. ice bunny said uh World War II, in World War II, the Danes made the Germans to clean up the landmines they dumped on the west coast of the land. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also a part of, like, you have to clean up your own mess. I don't like that there are landmines all over the world that have just been, like, left by the United States or other countries. It's like, what the fuck? Why are we not forced to go clean those up? Um. Anyway, let's look at some memes. Let's do a little bit of happy stuff for a minute before we get back into sad. And then I have happy at the end. We're going to talk about some solutions. Okay, so this is a tweet from Ty Tony Deus on Twitter. Uh, you are a villager in Stardew Valley. You approach your hangout spot by the sea and find the new farmer. He's been fishing for 10 hours. He pauses to horf down four pieces of raw seaweed. He notices you and gives you an uncooked egg from his pocket. Your fondness for him grows. Heck yeah! Of course, weirdos amazing. That's all I'm gonna say. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay, this one is from the Stardew Valley Reddit and it's just a 10 foot long sturgeon believed to be between 500 and 600 pounds was caught, tagged, and re-released by a fishing guide in British Columbia. And I just want you all to see how big this fish is. This is amazing. Look at how big this is. I want to hug it. I just want to, like, wrap my arms around it. But it would probably be too big for me to wrap my arms around. And it's long. It's huge. And that's one of the things that makes me sad is because... It didn't used to be that rare for a lot of species of fish that we think of as not that big to get huge. It just took time and a stable ecosystem. Yeah, I won't hug the fish. I just want to hug everything. I love hugs. Sometimes I wish my cats were bigger, uh, like the size of a, like a Labrador or something, so I could really hug them. Anyway, this fish is big. Chunky boy. Big chungus. I love it. Um, yeah, and yeah. Fish don't want... Fish don't want hugs. Especially not lobsters. Yeah. Okay. I tweeted this picture earlier, but I still like it. I might have even shared it before. I don't remember. I don't remember what I've said in previous streams. <laughs> I remember some of it. I remember some of it. Okay. Two pictures of SpongeBob. One, he looks all happy. He's offering up some money. City governments when asked to build a new sports stadium. And then SpongeBob looking out of breath and concerned. City governments when asked to build affordable, affordable, affordable public housing and public transport. And yeah, I did tweet it just now. Uh, but I wanted to make sure everybody saw it. Because not everybody looks at the Twitter. Some people just get the email that says we've gone live. Uh, 
yes. It makes me sad. I know there's a simple reason for this. We hate poor people. Uh, capitalism wanting to make money, but it's often short sighted, right? Because remember, we early in the series, we talked a lot about the concept of value per acre and how much you get. Uh, exactly, Reverend March. You know what the difference between sport, a sports stadium and a public transit is? The public transit owners don't donate to the next election campaign. Exactly. But like, if you, and that's one of the things that drives me nuts about how politics is gone is because it's become about short term issues exclusively almost across the board. Like, very much what's the hot button issue of today versus let's think about planning 20 years down the line. I remember when in Seattle, there was a project called Sound Transit 3 that was going to ex expand public transit. Absolutely necessary in Seattle. Um, because we have all these tech companies, traffic has become completely unmanageable. Also, we just need public transit in general. And it's going to take a long time to build it. And there was this talking point that was absolutely ridiculous. That was just like... Uh, it was ridiculous because, and I saw people I knew repeating it on Facebook all the time. And the talking point was, well, uh, this is going to come out of this kind of, it's going to come out of housing taxes. And most of the people who own housing are over 50. And this, you know, public transit will take, project will take 10 years to finish. So some percentage of the people who are going to pay for it aren't going to be alive to use it. And I was just like, that is literally true of everything your taxes pay for like what what that doesn't even make any sense stupid wrong wrong just no anyway sometimes sometimes i just want to bang my head against the wall okay next meme this is from sir eviscerate on twitter Hey man, the leaves, they fall off your tree. They're incredibly biodegradable and will be gone by the end of winter, so you better hurry up and rake them into plastic bags. So they're not always gone by the end of winter, but I do want to stress that it's really sad that we rake our leaves. because, And I blame our obsession with, you know, Baroque period French gardens, but um, we need to build soil and leaves breaking down really helps build soil. And it really helps make sure that a lot of the energy from the sun, a lot of the nutrients that have been absorbed from by the tree get back into the ground. It is an essential part of the sort of like circulatory system of any little ecosystem or biome or anything because we need that recycling. And also, there are lots and lots of creatures, different types of bees, field mice, voles, some types of birds, rabbits, that need that leaf cover for their habitats. And when we pull it all up, we're really making the life's, the landscape around us a lot more barren. And that makes it so much more vulnerable. Exactly, Krellen. Soil is made of leaves. Just leave the leaves there. Just do it. Basically, whenever I've had landlords who were like, you have to make sure there are never any dandelions and you have to remove the leaves right away, and they also claim to care about the environment, I'm like, you don't care about the environment, you care more about what the neighbors think. Especially if there's not an HOA demanding something. Yes, exactly, Reverend Moore. To be fair, depending on where you live, people rake their leaves because they can get fined hundreds of dollars if they don't. Because for some reason, we decide that it's fair to let homeowners associations financially penalize people for not adhering to aesthetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <sighs> 
And one of the things that's tough because we've like replaced all other forms of like community conflict management with the police, there's no way I can just tell my neighbors or my homeowners association, fuck off if you want to rake, if you want these leaves gone, you come and rake them yourselves. Or like, if you come onto my property, I'm going to use my flamethrower, get the fuck away from me, leave the leaves alone, because we just use the police to manage everything. And there's no other way to like settle anything. I don't know. I'm kind of digressing. Um, Krillin, the only place it is acceptable for an HOA to exist is a condo complex because it's the only situation that requires an HOA. Yeah, agreed. Reverend Morton, to be clear, I'd be fine with that if they also allowed me to demand financial compensation from everyone who wears a boring business suit with wacky socks in an original way to show their original. Yeah, I know. Why is it? In an original way to show their original. Why is that always what people want to do? It's like, you can wear brightly colored suits, and like if everybody's wearing wacky socks, it's not that wacky anymore. Okay, so this is a totally different topic, but I think it's really relevant to the idea of a boring dystopia. Because this is the thing: is it's like it's so many things are dystopian, like the stuff that homeowners associations do, where they can just chop down, like we read a few weeks ago, like. A, a pollinator paradise that has been growing for 10 years while a woman's away on vacation. They can just like say that birds and butterflies being in a neighborhood like we read months ago is somehow like a big offense while spraying incredibly toxic things all over the ground that like poison children and animals and get into the ecosystem and cause havoc. And it gets, we end up just being like fine whatever and acquiescing because it's so boring that it sucks all the life out of you and there's so much sort of like levels of frustration to get to and you have very little agency and it's very like unrelenting that it really just breaks a person down and people get into what one social psychologist called the agentic personality. It's the whole I'm just following orders where people stop using critical thinking and empathy when interacting with other people and just focus on the idea of, well, I'm just following the rules and that's what the rules say. And it's like, but you could literally change the rules. And It's all a boring dystopia, right? Right, we're already living in a dystopia. There's still good things, right? Don't get me wrong. Like, even in a dystopia, there are still aspects that are good. There will always be reasons for joy and laughter and celebration. You know, people have birthdays. Kittens and puppies exist. You know, there are attractive people in the world. There are friends to be made. There's, like, all of these good things. You get to sleep and have nice dreams sometimes. Like... You know, there's always reasons to celebrate. And it's uh, still a dystopia. So anyway, there's this is some Tumblr stuff, I think. But this first person, the seven umbrellas, says, anyone else feel burnt out by streaming services? Because anytime you start a show, the company expects an immediate audience and a fucking worldwide campaign of support or they'll cancel it. This is why I don't get into a lot of new shows, because every time I found a show that I really love, it ends up getting canceled after a season or two. There have been shows where I've been like six seasons deep, and I'm like, whoa, these twists and turns are so amazing. I can't wait to see how they wrap it up, even if it's cringy and bad. I just like really need a resolution here. And then it's canceled, and I'm like, it's like Farscape all over again. It just makes me sad. Okay, and Neil Gaiman tweeted, it does, yes, because they are looking at, com quote, completion rates. So people watch it at their own pace, watching it at their own pace don't show up. And this was Neil Gaiman replying to somebody saying, we've been purposely stretching it out to make it last longer. Does it look more popular if we binge watch it all at once, asking for a friend? And this is one of those things is like, I don't always have the energy to binge watch a show. I don't always have the time. Sometimes I'm really liking a show. Like I've been, I enjoyed Sandman. I don't want to binge it all in one night. I want to stretch it out, give it time. And you're right, Reverend Moritz, the solution is often fanfic. Um, yeah, I read this book series called The Three-Body Problem. I really want to encourage everybody to read it. It's 
incredibly good. The new type of fear I experienced in the last third of the last book was a type, I didn't know I could feel that kind of fear. Uh, and it's changed my life in some very interesting ways. And I really want to encourage everyone to read it. It's wonderful books. Um, and there's a fourth book that's literally a fan fiction that the author liked so much uh, to tell the story of these two people. And it's also good. Um, yeah, the Chinese author. Uh, Shikshin Liu. Uh, great. Absolutely great. I really want to recommend. Anyway. The fact that they always want to look for an immediate... And this is one of the things that's rough because the idea of storytelling, right? This is... Storytelling is one of the oldest human technologies, right? Like it's came after language, after all these other technologies, but it's an early technology that we have. And it's one of our best ways to teach People tend to remember stories a lot better than they remember, you know, a bunch of random facts. People tend to remember how something made, they made them feel than necessarily exactly what happened. Storytelling is an incredibly important and powerful tool that we have. It's one of the reasons why media is so important, right? There's something very human about our love of storytelling. And... You know, I think about how cool it would have been to be into the Homeric ep epics like, you know, uh, the Odyssey and wait for the next epic storyteller to come to your village so you can get the next chapter and how you and your friends probably would have sat around and wondered about what was going to happen next and talked about all of these different things and been like oh yeah do I feel like I've interacted with the gods in this way or that way like it's happening in the story or oh I'm so thankful that that's not me or whatever and it's a and then like coming together as a village to sit and enjoy a storyteller who's come along. And I think about media and storytelling as this incredible tool, this incredible vehicle for social bonding, social reproduction, just interest and fun. And I feel like these giant media conglomerates are really abusing this sort of very human impulse to tell and listen to stories and it makes me angry anyway boring dystopia uh reverend Morty said bad fanfic preferably find the weirdest you can internalize it entirely then proceed to get all your friends to do it too then refuse to deny that what uh Deny that isn't what happened. Go to cons. Talk about how that last season was a real twist to the creators, preferably. Nothing will discourage companies from canceling shows like the worldwide spread of the claim that they finished it with a graphic on screen interspace, interspecies orgy. Hell of a way for Firefly to end that. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Murray say, if the internet could get Morbin time to spread so hard, Sony put the movie back in theaters and get HBO to think we all insist Batwoman ended with a WWE crossover in which Batwoman murdered Vince McMahon. I love it. I love it. I mean, there's a lot of interesting fanfic out there and it's fun to read it and it's fun to like. One, it's also really nice to see just how many people are also really talented authors. There are a lot of people who are not talented authors. Like, they can still create interesting premises, but, like, the actual craft of their writing. I mean, I kind of feel that way about Neil Gaiman. Like, I think Neil Gaiman's world building, the, the plots that he creates, amazing. I love them. But sometimes I read paragraphs and I'm like, this is just terribly written. <laughs> like, this is, just an, this is just word salad, basically. Or, like... It's clunky or the dialogue doesn't feel natural. And then there are lots of authors that I've read where I'm like, every passage is like a work of art. And then the story is boring as hell. You know, I really want to fix this chat. Is there a way I can fix it? Can I just make it bigger? Will that fix it? No. 
I think what I need to do is go in and edit it in Stream Elements. It's just a little cut off. It's a little bothering me. Anyway, continuing. Boring dystopia. Okay, uh, this is from at LaserDoove on Twitter. So sad that kids today spend so much time online. When we were kids, we were always outside throwing rocks at one another, smoking, lighting small fires, stealing car hood ornaments, shoplifting, taking drugs. One time I drank gasoline, and I just want to be like, same. That's all. I just want to say that people are always like, oh, kids these days, or oh, this or that. And then it's like, well, well, do you forget what you were like as a kid? Do you forget the stuff you got up to? Uh, but also, like, maybe it's good for kids to get into some amount of trouble, but this is also one of the problems with excessive policing, right? We've made it so that pretty normal kid behavior of understanding cause and effect, understanding your agency, understanding what it's like to exert your will on reality, understand what it's like to interact with another person's consent, to cross boundaries, and it's experience consequences to negotiate things i mean i don't want kids drinking gasoline obviously like there are th there are real injuries that i would like to prevent happening to kids but getting into a kid fist fight on occasion where you're like not bullying but you're like settling you know normative conflict or you know building things together that then collapse or getting injured because you built a ramp to do you know big jumps on your bicycle and you smash your face into the handlebar uh that kind of i mean like there's things that are normal and that i think are good for kids and i'm sad that kids don't be play because of the way we've decided that the only community interventions we can have for settling conflict is basically policing, we've really taken away a lot of important learning and growth opportunities uh, for children. Also, this is kind of zoomed in too much, I just realized. Um, well, silly Millie, I don't necessarily think it means you're a more boring child, but uh, maybe you just weren't getting into the same kinds of trouble. Yeah. And I think it's important that, like, <sighs> kids have the opportunity to make certain kinds of mistakes in a, a relatively safe environment, right? Where, like, you're, like, shoplifting, for example. I'm not saying shoplifting is a good thing to do, but it's a very common thing that kids do at some point in time. Not every child, for sure. And not every child without outside influence. Like, I had a neighbor, who, the mother, try to teach me how to shoplift. And she would take me and her kids and some other kids from the neighborhood into stores and then, like, try to get us to shoplift different things. And I was never really very comfortable with that. And, and then in high school, I had friends who liked to shoplift at, like, Spencer's or, like, different, you know, stealing different knickknacks or like they wanted to steal makeup or a t-shirt. And I never did it. I did a little bit when I was very, very young, uh, around fourth grade, the neighbor who was teaching us to do all of this because mostly because of social pressure, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, and then I decided I didn't like it and made me feel ill and I didn't do it again. And I think that in some ways, that was not a bad experience for me to have had, was to like witness adults behaving criminally, but in a very small way, witness sort of like group norm forming, and then being able to feel the social pressure, feel the tension inside of myself, and then come to the conclusion that this was not something I wanted to do, and not risk being arrested. And Krillin, you know, let people have things. Yeah. And I think that, uh, Reverend Mort, you said, legitimately fun fact, I realized as a later adult that technically my mom made me participate in illegal drug trafficking. Oh, yeah, this is also one of those things. Is like a lot of us have committed felonies and ne don't never even know that we did. 
like there are things where it's like there are a lot of laws like technically in Massachusetts it's still a law that you're not allowed to take a bath at night is that law going to be enforced no and this is obviously not the only kind of felony I'm talking about but like sharing a medication or you know uh lying about certain types of things or like not reporting certain things on your taxes i don't know uh exactly reverend mort by helping her share some of her legal opiate medication to other legal opiate medication using friends who had run out but I still get to say I was a drug smuggler as a seven-year-old. Yeah, I mean, like, this is it. Like, people can have committed huge crimes with no criminal intent and no awareness that they were actually doing anything wrong. And because the only system we have in place to correct certain types of behaviors is the criminal justice system and it's a punitive system, it really robs people of a lot of opportunities for growth. It also makes us afraid of accountability for many reasons. Um, me too, Arad, and I also used to love to read about old laws. Okay, next meme. This one I just want to share with all of you. I'm going to share the link. Hopefully it still works because I want you all to internalize this because it goes back to that, like, you have a book that is your life and you're, every day you're writing the story of it and whatever story you write is that story. Now you can, like, there's like some philosophy of identity where like every time you recall your history, you're doing a kind of myth making because you can always reinterpret your memories differently and you're allowed to choose to change your story. But it still comes back to this idea where I say you only get to you only get one life. Don't spend it at war with yourself. Life is hard enough. Be nice to yourself as much as you can. You can hold yourself accountable. You can try to do better. You can grow as a person without being unkind to yourself. So please be nice to yourself. Okay, let's move into some other stuff. So I just want to share some cute pictures. This is on Nantucket, Massachusetts. Look at how cute and walkable this is. These are all these little shop fronts. You've got housing up in the top and there's still parking if you want it. And this is lovely and quaint and we could have this. I like looking at walkable streets because it makes me feel good. It makes me feel hopeful. Uh, this is also Massachusetts. Then you got Philadelphia. And things can improve, right? You can see here, they went from very heavy traffic space to pedestrianized areas. And it looks nice. Looks very nice. Um, Bergen, I've actually been to Bergen. It was an adorable place. It looked a lot like Seattle, which makes sense because a lot of Scandinavians came to the Seattle area in the early 1900s. Uh, very walkable, really lovely. We could have these things. We could have these things. Look, this person is saying historic downtown Jersey City is one of my places, favorite places to go visit. We're so used to living in like very soulless and welcoming places that a walkable area that is even a little bit cute becomes a huge draw because it creates a sense of you're allowed to be here. Remember we talked before about like, does the way a city or a town is set up make you feel like you are welcome, that you have p permission to use the space. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I agree, Aradin, don't should yourself. Be nice to yourself. Okay, walkable streets, super cute. I love them. They make me so happy. Just look at how nice this is. It's great. All of this is great. This looks like Chinatown in Boston. Probably isn't, but it looks really similar. Okay, walkable streets. If you just want good vibes, I just always recommend this subreddit. Just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. All right, 
Uh, this one is a bit dystopian. We're going back to some boring dystopia stuff. I tried to pace it a little bit. Pizza delivery man runs into burning home to save five children, jumps from second floor holding a child. So then save the green text is save five children from a burning building, get injured in the process of being a hero, needs to start a GoFundMe for the medical bills. It doesn't have to be this way. And this is one of the things that makes it a boring dystopia is it's just like never ending exhaustion. And I just want you to think about like how much the way the world is set up in daily life that sucks energy out of you, that doesn't have to be that way, right? Like sure going grocery shopping can be exhausting or like doing laundry or washing dishes, that kind of stuff. But just thinking about like commuting and having to deal with, you know, open office plans and having to deal with, you know, not having any nice places to like go or yeah, Krellen, you're right. GoFundMe CEO is like, why are we the largest health insurer in the US? Yeah. Anyway, it just could be better. We let a lot of things slide because we're so used to having all of our energy sucked away. This is one of those things we're so used to a lot of constant consent violations and things that suck away our agency and our sense of belonging that we then don't even realize when it's happening to us. And you're right, Aradin. It's a lot of people don't want people to feel welcome. Yeah. So this one also, I should have ordered it a little bit dif differently, but this is an interesting image or tweet where it's saying, what happened to the movies? I looked at the top 2,100 domestic box office films, so this is in the U.S., of the last 42 years to find out, and here's some findings. For one, more sequels and comic book movies. In 1981, just 16% of top 25 movies were sequels, spinoffs, or remakes. In 2019, 80% more. So this is more of one of the issues that has happened with things being very profit motive driven, especially giving investor dividends, where it's not just that you need to make a profit, it's that you need to make a profit that and then it enables you to pay a ton of money to shareholders. And what is this doing then to our storytelling? What is that doing to our cultural sort of myth making? What is that doing to, I don't know, just our enjoyment? Also conglomerates, monopolies, they become more conservative, right? We lose out on innovation. If people, you know, if you get a hard on for innovation, you should really be anti-monopolies because monopolies become more conservative and unfettered, unregulated capitalism and capitalism more broadly always trends towards monopolies because it allows bigger, more powerful companies to buy up smaller more innovative ones that tend to have a lower return on investment for their products or whatever they're making. And it's just sad. It's just sad. Just look at this sadness. Sad. All right, I'm going to send you all the links. Uh, Silly Millie, you said, I've been thinking a lot lately about what does it mean to be me? What matters to me about myself? What do I value? I if I woke up tomorrow with no memories, but I could have a single page of notes on how to be me, what would I want on that page? It is giving me a deeper sense of peace. Nice. I like it. Uh, Ice Bunny, what did you just use the word innovation? Last week, we didn't need innovation. So here's, I'm talking, okay, yeah, innovation. I'm not saying we don't need innovation around climate change. I'm saying that on the energy front on the like reducing our carbon output from our energy sources we don't need more innovation we already have the innovation we've already invented the technologies there's just not the political will to use them and innovation otherwise can be good all right continuing uh i'm gonna close this one Here's a video of Arlington, um, and just, you can all look at it. Uh, and you're, I do agree with you, Ice Bunny, like, yes. But you can see here, Arlington, Texas is not a good city. 
It has 4,000, 400,000 people and carries the title of being, sorry, I missed what that said. <laughs> Uh, of being the biggest American city with no public transportation. Um, just look at this, how big these streets are, mandatory parking minimums, so how much we seed. <laughs> so how much of the square footage ends up needing to be for parking how this ends up looking. You could fit four of these buildings and the amount of parking space there. It's not nice. There's very few trees. There's not a lot of, everything's far away. Exa I agree with you, Reverend Moore. Being good does not change your cultural impact, how popular and widespread you are does. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna read one sad article. What? one good article and then I have some resources to share. So the sad article, it's from the UN Environment Program and it's talking about from Chile to China, the global battle against desertification. So this is something that is really affecting really everywhere right now where things are becoming more desert because of increasing temperatures, increasing a rate of us pulling water out and then also because we've cut down so many trees because we've removed so much vegetation when winds blow they're able to take soil off and now it's important to know that as it currently stands there's only so much land that we could actually reconvert into forest uh, john oliver just did an amazing piece on carbon capture initiatives and people set our carbon offset where people are trying to say like oh we're offsetting our carbon emissions by investing in these trees and why it's often kind of a bureaucratic lie again a boring dystopia it's paperwork to make you seem like you're doing something you're actually not while the world continues to get hotter and the very poor international oversight of this problem Check out the newest Last Week Tonight episode. It's on YouTube, and it really goes over some related issues to this. Um, and so let's, and this is from, as you can see here, the uh, 10th of May. Let me make sure that the page looks good. Yes. Um, and... I will put the link in the chat because I just realized I hadn't done that. Okay, so um, okay, so in May 2022, global leaders are meeting in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, for the 15th session of the Conference of Parties, COP15 of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. The event, which will also see participation from the private sector, civil society, and other stakeholders, focuses on how to protect and sustainably manage one of the Earth's most precious commodities, land. Here, we look back at a 50-year global effort to halt the spread of the world's deserts. Uh, Yakuba Sawandogo, 76, has been a farmer for much of his life, tending a plot of land in a semi-arid stretch of central Burkina Faso. But in the 1980s, that way of life almost came to an end. Severe droughts triggered soil erosion and land degradation, crippling, or I should say, impairing farms uh, across Burkina Faso and much of West Africa. Quote, people were leaving and the animals and trees were dying, Sawandogo recalled. Uh, we had to look at a new way to farm. Amid the crisis, Sawadogo developed a modified version of traditional farming practice known as Zai that would help crops survive on minimal rainfall. 40 years on, the technique has revolutionized farming in much of Africa, earning him the nickname, the man who stopped the desert. Sawadogo, a United Nations environmental program, champion of the earth, is part of a global effort to slow the process of desertification taking place everywhere from northern Chile to the Taklamakan Desert in China. I definitely didn't pronounce that right. 
Uh, for nearly 50 years, UNEP has played a key role in the global fight against desertification by supporting visionaries like Sawadogo, providing scientific expertise, financing innovation, land, innovative land restoration projects, and galvanizing nations to take coordinated action against desertification. So the thing is, is that this is one of those things that's really nice. Is like, this is a huge problem. And one of the points I've tried to make is like, we can get really overwhelmed by these problems, thinking that we're starting from nothing and that nobody's doing anything about it. And the problems are big and they are gonna require a lot of action from us, but there are lots of people with innovations that are already working on these things. And we don't need to wait for some miracle technology to come along and save us. There's so many different aspects of climate change that need to be tackled. And not just climate change, but like, you know, environmental degradation is more what I think we should talk about because climate change is just one aspect of this. But there are so many things that we've done that have harmed the planet that need to now be taken care of. And there are lots of people doing this work and lots of people who we can join in with. This is also one of those important points about not making your activism about yourself. Because if it becomes about yourself, we end up wanting to view ourselves as basically the heroes or the protagonists of a story rather than part of a larger web of people passionately advocating for change and trying to make change and to me the second is a lot more interesting like i don't want the burden of trying to be a hero or taking everything on myself i love teamwork I love sharing responsibilities with other people. And if we bring that into our thinking about many aspects of our life, it makes things a lot less intimidating and scary. Climate change and climate deg or you know, environmental degradation are things that can be very scary and really overwhelm us and do put us all at risk. And we can do so much about it together. And as we've talked about in previous streams, there is always the question of when do you start to do more direct action? When are, does it make sense to like put your physical body in front of something to blockade things or protest outside of people's houses, make sure there's no peace, really make sure that things change. And I do think that unfortunately, we will likely get to that point and well beyond it before big changes are made. And it, there's still work that we can do. Locally and internationally, there's so many things we can do. So let's look at some of the work that's being done on preventing desertification. So UNEP's mission to combat desertification has been underpinned by the notion that as devastating as desertification can be, it can also be easily solved with targeted land restoration. This is something Ibrahim Tile I really wish I knew how to pronounce more names. Uh, the executive secretary of the UN convention to combat desertification calls practical, cheap, and accessible to all communities. You know, everyone's name should just have a little IPA guide underneath them because that I could actually read. As Taya put it, you don't have to be a scientist to do land restoration. So this is an important thing. There are things that you can do on any land that you own or even rent if you negotiate with your landlord. But then also you can create action groups with your neighbors or just other people in your broader community to say like, we want this park to include more amount of biodiversity sort of like hubs, right? Most parks, while they do have trees and other plants in them are actually like biodiversity destructive things because they end up being really manicured, the lawns are really mowed. It's not all entirely turf grass, but it's often majority turf grass, which as we've looked at before, does nothing to help prevent, you know, 
water loss, soil loss, instability in the ground, it's not a good place for there to be biodiversity. So there are things that you can do and there are ways that you can create parkland that people like and what we think of as a park while also creating other things. And you could push to make it so that like there's a new law in your town or whatever that any park in, or green space, including all the stupid golf courses, must include at least X percentage of this kind of biodiversity hub and it must be maintained and you can't take action to limit or corral the you know biodiversity there and you can't do things within a certain space that like certain pesticides or whatever like these are things we could do um enough pressure a lot of city councils and town planning councils are small and they're just a couple random people and maybe it can be tough if they're like the owner of the golf course or whatever uh, I don't know about smart golf courses. I mean, like, I have a, I will fully admit I have a strong bias against golf courses. Um, I see them and I just think about death. They represent death to me, uh, and waste. But a lot of that comes from the fact that my grandparents lived in Arizona for a long time. I have a lot of family in Arizona. And every time I would visit them, they didn't like golfing. And they thought golfing and golf courses in the desert were like a crime against humanity. But um, it's wild to be in like a place where there's like citrus trees planted, but they have to paint the bark white to help reduce the risk that these trees are just going to catch on fire. And then you see lush green lawns and you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Again, this is one of those problems of us trying to have the same lifestyle everywhere all the time. That doesn't make sense. It makes sense that you could have golf courses in say the Scottish Highlands where golf was invented and play there, have fun. It's lumpy, enjoy is a better challenge where like, it makes sense to play that kind of game uh, and you don't have to radically reorganize the ecosystem and the, the landscape in order to, yeah, I don't know. It was a joke forevermore. You know, I don't always understand jokes. I have a tendency to take things you say very literally. Um, I've gotten better about it over the years. Ice Bunny, do you play golf or do you still have sex? Is not is that not the same thing? Good question. Uh, I agree, silly Millie. Lawns there depressed me as well. Like you can have some some big cacti and some like there's these like long grasses that grow in the deserts there great because they hide the, the jackrabbits really nicely. My grandfather used to take me out at night and we would go out when the, the moon was out so you could really see and we'd get these long sticks and we'd like gently rustle the grasses and then watch the big jackrabbits run out. And it was very exciting because then you get to see them. Anyway. I'm sorry, Ice Bunny. I didn't understand. <laughs> I'm not good with jokes. I'm trying. I try so hard. Sometimes I get jokes. Most of the time I take things entirely, literally. Uh, it's difficult. I don't have, somehow I don't have that much of a problem with like English language idioms. And like sometimes I understand idioms all right in other languages, but for the most part, jokes are difficult. Um, Old dudes play golf. That's true. That's true. That's kind of what I thought you meant. Um, Arada and you said, why is it that when it comes to things like climate change or similar things, it is, quote, I'm not a scientist, so I can't do anything about this. But when it comes to medical or really political views, pretending to be medical views, then things suddenly then suddenly everyone is an expert. Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating. All right, so let's read some more of this. The Gathering Storm. 
First identified as a problem in the 1960s, desertification is now commonly accepted as one of the most pressing environmental issues facing the world. I feel like this is a title used for so many environmental issues. It's so, pre I mean, they're all pressing, right? It's like, again, why it's easy to feel overwhelmed and then we'll want to reject the whole idea. It's also, I think, one of the reasons why a lot of people want to believe that something grand will come along and fix the whole problem. Solutions are already here. We have to change the way we live our lives. And the sooner we do that, the better. And it's not bad. Like think about the energy usage that say your grandparents had, right? If we returned to the amount of energy sort of globally that like our grandparents used and we've shifted things around a little bit, we've gotten more efficient with certain things, certain things take less energy. It doesn't mean we have less medical care or anything like that. In fact, we could have more. Um, our grandparents didn't have terrible lives. Ignoring world wars or whatever that they may have lived through. Um, but in terms of their ability to buy things, their ability to take vacations, their ability to enjoy their lives globally. You know, maybe your particular grandparents had a shit time. Like, you know, that's fine. Setting that aside, globally, thinking of their generation, returning to that level of energy consumption and resource usage, that's not a bad life. Oh, God, that's amazing, Reverend Murray. Or Arizona becoming the dark souls of golf because you can only use whatever's already in the environment. I love it. All right, so... Um, Land degradation and desertification uh, negatively affects 3.2 billion people around the world today. So this is also one of the things that's really important to think about. All of these issues, people talk about 2050, blah, blah, blah. As we've talked about, a lot of us will still be alive in 2050. I will be in my late 50s, early 60s, I think. I Don't ask me to add. Uh, 2050, you know, that's still pretty young, right? That's not like, I'm very likely to be alive at this time. And that's, we act as though somehow all of the negative effects of climate or environmental degradation are all going to sort of come to a head right at 2050. And it's not likely, we're already seeing the impacts and it's just going to continue to happen over time. Uh, and um, anyway, it's gonna continue to happen over time and it's already affecting people, right? Like there's risks of famines all over the world because of these massive heat waves and droughts and not just talking about like, you know, Russia holding Ukraine's grain hostage and the fact that like, you know, a lot of harvesting and planting is unlikely to happen that a bunch of farming probably just didn't happen this past spring because of the war. But we're also thinking about like in the, I think the Sichuan region of Southern China, right now, Southern China is dealing with massive droughts, desertification and forest fires happening that threaten really essential harvests this fall and risk putting a bunch of people into famine. So like we're already dealing with the worst effects of climate change. Uh, when we think about the worst effects being human suffering and de death, Right. Okay. To make matters worse, the problem he added disproportionately harms those who are the least able to do anything about it. Rural communities, smallholder farms, and the extremely poor. So we have a picture here. A worker rests on the roof of a building surrounded by sand as a result of desert encroachment at or green railway station. Um, and you can see like he's sitting on the roof because the sand is piled so high. Uh, almost a quarter of the world's total land area has been degraded with far reaching implications for every single person on this planet, according to the Global Environmental Facility, which serves as the financial mechanism for several environmental conventions, such as the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. 
According to the GEF, unchecked desertification can lead to food shortages, volatility, and increases in food prices caused by declines in the productivity of croplands. Heightened impacts of climate change globally caused by the release of carbon and nitrous oxide from degrading land. So this is one of those many ways in which as climate change increases, it will be self-reinforcing. And there are tipping points that we may face and the threat of social instability from the forced migration that will result. Contrary to common misconception, desertification is not necessarily the natural expanse of existing deserts, but rather the degradation of land over time due to overcultivation, overgrazing, deforestation, and poor irrigation practices. And although desertification is ultimately man-made, it is exacerbated by the extreme weather, such as droughts and heavy rains associated with climate change. So this is a very important idea to understand what desertification is. Uh, is the party not brushing that under the rug? Yeah, I mean, we brush a lot of things under the rug. Uh, so when you said Dallas had drought all summer, then got half a year's of yeah, half a year worth of rain fall in a few hours yesterday. Yeah, I mean, this is also going to become more common. And that's not like it doesn't make up for it, right? Having this huge drought and then getting a massive amount of rain, when the ground becomes that dry and cracks, it also puts you at risk of a lot more flooding, mudslides cliff faces collapsing like all over England and Ireland all of these beautiful high cliffs that are along the ocean have just been collapsing because it got too hot and rocks expanded when they got hot and then caused the sort of cliff there to destabilize um give me one second I just got a text message that I do need to respond to um uh Okay, uh, it's just planning for stuff for this evening, for picking my brother up and some things we want to do to prepare. Okay, that can start a vicious cycle where land degradation leads to loss of vegetation and forests that reduces the Earth's capacity to sequester carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, thus worsening the climate crisis. In fact, it was years of drought in the Sahel region of Africa in the late 1960s and early 70s that caused severe food shortages and the deaths of tens of thousands of people. The calamity alarmed the UN and focused global attention on desertification as a looming crisis. Start of a movement. So in 1977, the UN General Assembly discussed the dire situation in the Sahel and passed a resolution to convene the UN Conference on Desertification. Ironically, on a rainy day in late August 1977 in the Kenyan capital city of Nairobi, some 500 delegates from 94 countries gathered to start a two-week conference designed to tackle the continent's desertification ticking time bomb. So here we have an image of a forest looking pretty dry. A uh, tree stands in an area that is part of the Great Green Wall of the Sahara and the Sahel on the outskirts of Walald, Walald Department in Senegal. And uh, continuing, born out of the conference uh, was the plan of action to combat desertification, a blueprint for restoring the productivity of arid, semi-arid, subhumid, and other areas vulnerable to desertification in order to improve the quality of life of their inhabitants. In the last 50 years, UNEP, in concert with its global partners, has taken a lead on the issue, aside from providing scientific data and expertise. Another crucial part of UNEP's work has been to build global political consensus on the crisis. Um, and it's, yes, ice bunny cliffs have collapsed before climate change was a thing. Floods happened, hurricanes, all of these things happened before climate change. The idea is that climate destabilization will only make these things more commonplace. Anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, 
having a clear and achievable na- I'm going to assume I was here. I don't remember where it was. Having clear and achievable national action plans is a critical aspect of UNEP's other great achievement, the formation of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, which was adopted in 1994 and entered into force in 1996. So, like, you know, all of these efforts wouldn't be happening if there wasn't actually a problem, right? We wouldn't have massive international bodies working hard, collaborating, worried about these things. You wouldn't have dozens and dozens of scientists being like, this is a huge pressing issue and things could become very bad if these weren't things that actually really needed tending. And so we need to work together on these things. We need to take them seriously. And we don't want to get into whataboutism. Whataboutism is where you're never allowed to talk about any specific single issue because people are always like, well, what about this? Or what about that? Or what about this? And then the conversation can never be about the thing you're trying to talk about. And we need to be really careful with that. We also have to be careful not to lose all hope, though climate doomism works for some people. And if that's what makes you feel motivated, please continue with it. I think that I like to push back against that idea because I think it's a little too self-focused and a little less focused on sort of continuity and longevity of human society. It's similar to why I don't like people talking about things like humans as a virus or humans as an invasive species, because one, Neither of those things are actually true. Um, We're not really an invasive species. Many ecosystems evolved with human interaction and intervention and influence as part of them. And there is no ecosystem on the planet that we do not affect. Um, And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it also kind of then saying like humans are a virus then it erases indigenous people who protect something like 80% of the world's biodiversity or blames people who are, you know, causing almost no climate impact uh, equally as people who are causing a ton of it. So I don't like those ideas that like we're a virus, we're an invasive species, blah, blah, whatever. Um, similar to why I don't like the idea that nothing's wrong, therefore we don't have to do anything, or the idea um, (laughs) I like these comments. So uh, Ice Bunny said, one thing with scientists is that they are not the best communicators around and make things sound more complicated than they can be if they want a broader public to do things. Yeah, I've taught communication skills classes specifically to scientists about communicating controversial science, um, like things around climate change. And it's tough because, you know, it's a skill set that is uh, realistically, there should be experts whose job is just to be science communicators. And the scientists should be able to focus on the science. And yet we have complex needs. Um, I agree, Krellen. Imperialism is a virus. Reverend Mort, I like this. All whataboutism attempts should be met with a lyrical rewrite of Fatboy Slim's weapon of choice. You could what about this? You could what about that? Repeat forever. Yes. Silly Millie, there may be a human civilizations that are corruptions. Maybe we need to consider civilizations or a bio unit. I mean, there are philosophical stances that look at that specifically. Even the book Leviathan kind of had that kind of premise. Um, Yeah, Erod, and the saying we're an invasive species, like then we don't have to do anything or saying the solution is to cull some amount of human civilization. And the implication there is always cull the undesirable people and then like who's labeled undesirable. Uh, Reverend Mort, you say it's the same problem we have in politics. You win political offices with PR skills and debate tactics. You do well at political offices with bureaucracy skills and administrative talents. They're, the two are not connected. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so continuing. 
To date, the convention is the world's sole legally binding international agreement that explicitly links the environment and development to sustainable land management, especially in the drylands of the world home to some of the most vulnerable people and ecosystems. Uh, the UNCCD legally obligates its 197 parties to take various actions, including reporting on measures they have taken to implement the convention. Quote, when compared to other sectors, combating land degradation and desertification has not been the top priority for governments, said Adamu Buhari, a biodiversity and land degradation expert at UNEP. We have supported countries from all over the all over the world to develop a national action plan to combat desertification and align their national strategies with UNCCD 10 year strategies. Then we have a big quote here from Ibrahim. When you do land rest restoration, you address poverty, you address water issues, you address ecosystems issues, and you address climate change. So this is also one of the big points. Addressing the issue of climate change will really, really help with a lot of the other aspects of our daily life. To, to address climate change, to address environmental degradation, we will have to address a lot of other inequalities that are happening in the world, and therefore it will benefit us. To address climate change, we will have to address things like racism and sexism. We will have to address things like wealth inequality and resource inequality. And these are all things that benefit us. So, you know, it'll make the world a better place on many levels. Silly Millie, you say, or Ice when you ask as well, is that not what nature does with pandemics? Yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> I mean, like pandemics are a sort of an emergent thing that come out of certain conditions that tend to happen when human civilization gets too big and there's not enough space. I'm going to shrink this down and expand it so you can see this full image of the quote. Um, but it's not to say that this is like the solution to things. And it's also not to say that we need a shrinking population in order to tackle these issues. We don't. Um, okay. The UN, holding back the desert, UNEP and UNCCD were also at the forefront of the UN Decade for Deserts and the Fight Against Desertification, a global campaign from 2010 to 2020 to raise awareness about desertification, which threatened to derail any hope of reaching the Millennium Development Goals. So one of the reasons why it's important to raise awareness, especially in the places that are the most vulnerable, as it talks about up here, uh, most of desertification is man-made. Climate change is really affecting a lot of it, but it's also deforestation, overusing the land, overgrazing, overcultivation, and poor irrigation practices. Capitalism is influencing and pressuring us to do a lot of these things, but as are just sort of like global poverty and inequality there. If I'm in a desperately poor area and I have the opportunity to you know, make more money this year by overgrazing or, you know, over cultivating this land, even though in eight or 10 years, that means that this land will no longer be usable by me. Well, I need money now. <laughs> I need food now. I don't, if I'm risking, you know, falling into extreme poverty or dying, I don't have the ability to really plan for these future things. So, this is one of the reasons why. We need to have uh, uh, the climate change and ecosystem and environmental degradation is going to require us to tackle a lot of issues simultaneously. Um, so going back to where it was, despite, despite oh, no, no. Um, UNEP, in collaboration with the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, of the UN has also played a central role in the 2021 to 2030 UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. This global initiative brings together member states, local governments, academia, and the private sector to find suitable solutions or sustainable solutions to restore the health of ecosystems in which halting desertification is a key component. 
Despite the persistence of desertification as an environmental and economic crisis, the good news is that not only is it possible to halt, it's possible to reverse it. And UNEP has been the go-to institution for support and projects combating desertification. The Great Green Wall, a mosaic of land restoration activities stretching from Senegal to Djibouti, is a prime example. It's hoped that when this African-led initiative, which will be supported by the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, UNCCD and the UNEP is completed, it will contribute to reducing the impact of desertification in the Sahel and Sahara, restore degraded landscapes, and transform millions of lives in one of the world's poorest regions. Here, there's two people farming, maybe a third person, Senegalese, Senegalese plant circular gardens and green wall defense against desert. Uh, to help finance restoration work, UNEP is channeling private investments into the Sahel and other development regions. The Restoration Seed Capital Facility, for example, funds early stage forest restoration projects. And with partners such as Rabobank, UNEP is blending private and public funding for sustainable agriculture and forestry projects. This is one of the things that makes me sad because what if we just taxed billionaires? a lot more what if we just taxed all these rich companies more rather than having to say like oh rich company or rich person you can get a tax write-off or like whatever if you give all this money to fund this un initiative what if the un initiative did not have to go begging rich people and rich companies for funding to save the literally save the planet what if Okay, uh, UNEP is also implementing through the Restoration Initiative land restoration projects in Kenya, Tanzania, further and Tanzania. Furthermore, with the GEF, UNEP has implemented more than 160 land degradation projects to the tune of 130 million dollars over the last 24 years. This is an abysmally small amount of money over 24 years. Yes, I funny. some people need a carrot to do some good, but I don't like giving random individuals that happen to have a lot of money that much power over that many other people. They're not people who are elected. They're not people who sort of earned their position through their skills or expertise in terms of being like an environmental scientist or a humanitarian. They're just people who are rich. And a lot of rich people personally have more money than GDPs of entire countries. And that one person, therefore, then having more power in some ways than entire countries worth of people is terrifying. Just terrifying. It's true, though, that some people need a carrot to do good. And yeah. Uh, and you're right, Aradin. These people have so much power. Um, Silly Millie said, this could be tied to my depression earlier, either as depression causes hopelessness or my hopelessness causes my depression. I'm stuck in a negative spiral of both, that if I could break out, I might see else something else. Who knows? I started TMS yesterday. Yeah, I meant to ask, how is that going? Um, And Reverend Murray said, here's a tax write-off I support. For every dollar this program comes up short, we'll increase all corporate taxes by 1%. I like it. I like it. And, you know, I think that not losing hope is really important. So I have two resources I want to share. I don't want to um, spend too much more time on this article. Um, oh, thank you, Aradin, for moderating that. Um, uh, well, tremendous progress has been made in the fight against land degradation and desertification. Challenges persist. There is a disconnect. There is an illusion that land degradation is local and therefore some people will be spared, said Tia. Tia? I don't know. how. To, I want to know how to say this name. It's pure illusion. 
there is a shortage of food in one when there's a shortage in one part of the world everybody is affected when there is internal my international migration exacerbated by land degradation everybody suffers when there's a major disaster affecting millions of people the entire economy of the world is affected for Taya, recognizing the interconnectedness of the world's environmental problems is a shift in consciousness that needs to take place urgently. After all, he said, when you do land restoration, you address poverty, you address water issues, and you address ecosystem issues, and you address climate change. So again, all of these issues are interconnected, and it does come down to also empathy, right? And the recognition that none of us are going to be spared. Some of us, because of wealth or where we live or luck, will not feel as many issues as quickly as other people, but this will affect everybody. So one of the things that we can do is make our own soil, build soil locally, and help reduce desertification and soil degradation in your own area. And this is a great article that gives you some tips on how to make soil, uh, including what we talked about of using the leaves that fall off of trees. And it takes a long time for uh, soil to be made. So, you know, you don't want to add nitrogen rich fertilizers that are sort of like big, heavy industrial things, but you can keep manure, poop, animal poop in and of itself. And as it says here, although pathogens are less likely to be found in manures from homesteads and small farms than those from large confinement livestock operations, you should allow three months between application and harvest of root crops and leafy vegetables such as lettuce and spinach to guard against contamination. So this is if you're growing stuff in your yard, you don't have to. You can just build soil in the general area. You can do composting. So that means, you know, food scraps, uh, coffee grounds, all this other stuff. You can create really great fertilizer that way. I do a lot of sort of direct composting. I have a lot of house plants, as you can tell. I do composting. I use it as fertilizer especially things like coffee grounds. You can't overdo it with some plants, but it's really nice. Um, and, you know, chickens are great. If you have chickens, they will definitely help build soil. I love, I miss having chickens around. Um, and things like uh, dandelions are also incredibly helpful because dandelions actually help repair the soil a lot. People see dandelions and they think that it means they're a problem, they're a weed, but they're performing an essential function to the ecosystem. They're loosening up overly compacted soil. Their deep tap roots pull essential nutrients that are way deep in the ground up towards the soil so that they can be used. They do all kinds of things for an ecosystem. Do not destroy dandelions. They are important. And you can eat them if you like, it's true. Dandelions are amazing. Okay, so I want to share with you a webinar that is one of many related to the book Surviving the Future. Um, this was after David Fleming died. You can find some lectures with David Fleming, but they're usually kind of hard to hear, um, recorded in these sort of like big rooms. But Sean Chamberlain was the person who was working with David Fleming, was the main editor for the book. And these are, there are lots of these webinars and they're very, very hopeful. As you can see here, though, uh, if I scroll down, one of the recommended things is record drought poses serious threat to Europe's environment. These droughts are going to become a big problem. And it's also affecting, like, China has had to turn off lights. And it's ridiculous to me that, like, Shanghai, especially in the region called the Bund, I have visited there, it's beautiful, but they have all of these lights that are on all night unnecessary unnecessary they've had to turn them off because the droughts are causing water levels to drop so much that they cannot continue to get hydroelectric power so 
are rooster attacks a big problem? So you don't need to have roosters, first of all. Uh, but yeah, you don't really want to have the roosters around. You can put little like clip things on their their thumb type claw. Um, roosters are useful if you want your hens to lay more eggs. They will lay more eggs if a rooster is around. But hens will also basically abuse roosters. They will pull out all of their tail feathers. They will like. Uh, and you're right, Reverend Mort, the Bund is a place that's just glorious as a result of imperialist capitalism. Uh, you don't need to have roosters. You could have chickens without having roosters. Unnecessary. So there's another resource that I found that was really interesting. And this is a very long document. Well, I mean, it's 13 pages. But I want to recommend it because it's something that was, you know, created by the city of Vancouver. And it's called... You can see it all. Sharing our stories, building community resilience in Vancouver. And so this is a lot of really interesting and hopeful things. It's got background. It's got here this meaning of resilience, reflections on personal stories. How do we meet future shocks and stresses? The real interesting bit, community resilience now. I mean, this is the part that I really liked, which was sort of like going into how do we build better community resilience now with the resources we have. Um, resilience in the future, and this was related to an event, and I really recommend this document. It's one take on these things, but it's interesting because some of the stuff that you see in here is stuff that you can see playing out in the Game Stardew Valley. Um, and I would like to play a little bit maybe like 20 minutes before I need to go to run errands, but, you know, it's got a lot of really interesting things, talking about future shocks and stresses, you know, things that may affect the way we live our lives, and then how do we build community resilience now? And it really talks about how we can have cascading impacts, both positive and negative, and how we can encourage resilience. And I think it's it's very, you know, it's long in that it's 13 pages, but it's short and that it goes through everything pretty quickly. I recommend it. It's very cute. Um, <laughs> you're right, Krill, and I'm not fooling anyone. Anyway, with that in mind, though, <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, let's go over and play some video games. I gotta add chat in here. I forgot. Uh, okay, chat's huge. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, chat is gigantic. Um, I'm gonna put you all up here. That looks good. Okay. I'll move my video up too. That makes more sense. Uh, thank you all for dealing with me just fiddling around with my settings. But let's play a little bit of actual Stardew Valley. Um, where is this game? There it is. It's in the S's. Should have realized. Should have realized. I have played 229.5 hours of this game. That is... <laughs> Turning the, the game on counts as the play, you know. I love it, Ice Bunny. You make me feel better. Also, why is it cut off? This is weird. Okay, let me go to the actual game capture. I'm going to turn the volume down a little bit. Game capture, I need to resize you. Why are you so big? Why is it weird? Okay. There we go. Now if I actually make the game bigger, is that gonna mess everything up? No, that looks great. Okay.
The only difference is we can make trooper, trooper talk about fun stuff and not how bad the world is. Hey, I don't only talk about how bad the world is. I talk it's about lots of positive stuff, like how we can fight things and we can make the world a better place. But yeah, queen of sauce. All right, let's see what we got here. Pizza. I already know how to cook pizza. And oops, I'm not trying to pick up my TV. Is there anything in particular happening? Bring Emily an apricot. Strange note. Oh, yeah, I need to bring maple syrup. Still don't have any amethyst, so. And I need to get Mary Lewis the shorts. All right, so let's just see. What's the fortune teller saying? Very happy. Would be a good day for the mines. Oh man, I don't have auto petters, so I definitely need to pet all of these animals. Difficult. <laughs> so many animals. Sometimes just letting them all out in the morning is probably a bad idea. I should probably close the door after they go in for the night. Uh, so then I can get them all in the morning before I let them out. That would be smart. That would be smart. Oh yeah, I do need dinner. I uh, got my family really obsessed with this type of bread that you can get here in Austria called Laugen Ecke. It's like pretzel corner. And you make the uh, bread using lye, uh, which sounds really hardcore. And it's, oh man, I just tried to milk the cheese press. Uh, and it's, but it's really good. And it creates like kind of like a croissant and it's like many, many layers and fluffy, but it's totally different than any croissant you've ever had. And it's amazing. I recommend it. You got to try it. Bye, silly Millie. Have a good day. Uh, yeah, lye is pretty caustic substance, but and you could use it to dissolve things. It'll give you pretty bad burns if you're not careful. Um, but it makes delicious things. All right, I'm gonna go get some eggs. Ooh, I got a purple star egg. Don't eat the egg. All right. Oh, I didn't realize I had the special bait on there. Well, I need to feed my chickens. All right, all right. But yeah, I might have some of that for dinner with other things like vegetables, but kind of getting hungry now. Okay, I got an apricot. Oh my God. <laughs> Who wants the apricot? Emily. Okay, Emily. I can bring you an apricot. Let me go check on my... Uh... Are these harvestable? Yep. Got all this garlic. Nice. Garlic. Ooh, and honey. I could plant a lot more stuff. Dang. Requires a scythe. Oh my goodness, so many potatoes. Inventory full, what? Okay, fine, inventory's full. I'll put all the stuff I'm harvesting here. Inventory's full, huh? Well, I'm not going to ax any of my things. So yeah, okay. Ice Bunny, you want to talk about some positive stuff? I'm really excited that my brother's visiting me because uh, he's technically my half-brother. And so growing up as a kid, I only saw him every other weekend, one month during school vacation. Uh, I'm also more than 10 years older than him. So, you know, I saw him a little bit when we were kids. I got, you know, I, I would see him for some of the holidays, different times of year, but there was, it always meant that there was like not that much I got to see him. 
So the fact that he's coming to visit and he's going to be staying for like six weeks, even though he's sadly having like a bad morning and it's going to be a late day for him, he's not going to get in until really late. I'm still incredibly excited because it'll be basically some of the longest time I've spent with him since we were kids. Like I've had a week, a couple of weeks here or there. After I graduated from college, I lived at home for a few months with my mom. And so I got to spend a bunch of time with him, but he was like, you know, very young at that point in time. So I'm very, very excited because it'll be a really good chance for us to, I don't know, just really get to know each other in ways that we, we don't know each other at all. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really unique opportunity. The Proctor is still open, Ice Bunny, so I'm pretty excited. We'll go to the amusement park a few times, probably. Um, that'll be nice. Is Piers open today? I'm definitely a sister, not a cool aunt. Uh, but I'm a cool sister. I'm pretty close with both of my brothers in the sense that, like, we get along with each other really well. We share a lot. Things are really nice. How much would it cost for this bag? Not now. I have the money, but I do not want to spend the money. 12 days to get this cauliflower. I want to make some jazz seeds. Me. Okay, I'll get some jazz. And I want some cauliflower. I can plant more of that. I don't know what that is, Ice Bunny, so I'm assuming it's outside of Vienna. This music is so good. Uh, yeah, so I get along really well with both of my brothers. I really like both of them very, very much. Um, yeah. Okay. I have definitely more room. Let me, let me get some kale. Okay. I don't think I had a bunch of seeds hidden anywhere. I might have had seeds on my farm, but I don't think so. Oh, you don't hear music. Does that help? Can you hear music now? Oh, yeah, the young wine stuff. Yeah, that doesn't really open until the fall. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, it's like the first wine of the year. It's like to not totally finished, so it's not that alcoholic yet. It's only mildly alcoholic, um, and it's really sweet, and it's like called like young wine basically and it's really good stuff and people like to do this sort of festival where they tour around all the vineyards and get the wine and technically they can't serve hot food at them there's like some laws about like what a vineyard can and can't serve because then it would like have to count as a restaurant and so if they don't serve hot food they can get away with serving alcohol and getting around sort of certain licensing and restrictions um which is pretty funny but uh you know it's very lovely um i'm not a big drinker uh partially because if you were here for last week's tuesday stream i had a single light beer <laughs> that was not very alcoholic and i basically like fell asleep from how much it affected me uh, even though it was like many hours later, I was still feeling the effects because I'm a lightweight, as they say. I don't have my scythe on me. Silly. Uh, so it's not the, uh, not the easiest thing for me. I can't really do go to that many vineyards and taste that many wines before I'm just like sleepy time, nap time. And I sunburn too easily to take a nap outside um okay where's my scythe where did i put it here it is here's my scythe yeah i didn't have any 
sneaky um, seeds hiding anywhere. Yes, you do. If you, it is mildly laxative. So if anyone ever wants to try this young wine, just be very careful because it can have a big effect. <laughs> Or so I've been told. Thankfully, I have yet to have that experience. Why am I not hitting this piece of kale? I definitely can buy more seeds if I want to. I'm bumming because I want to be able to buy strawberry seeds. And I, I didn't, so that you can't get them until the festival and I didn't have the money last year to buy a bunch of strawberry seeds so I could grow them from right from the beginning. And that means that you don't get them any harvests of the strawberry seeds, so it's not very nice. Um, so one of the things I like about Stardew Valley uh, is that it's not very much a boring dystopia in the sense that there is a boring dystopia in that job you had for Joja Mart right at the beginning but you have a really good escape and in some ways uh because you have wealth you can escape a lot of that um it's not perfect i don't know i don't think stardew valley represents a really idyllic space in every sense but i think that it does have a lot of really good examples of things and lessons i don't know why i just hoed all of this but i did i did for fun. Uh, what did you say, Reverend Mark? Fun fact, I'm not a big drinker, but due to lack of storage space, I keep my heavy cocktail liquor in my computer desk. I have Cointreau, vodka, blue, Caruco, gin, and tequila in my desk. Makes me look like a raging alcoholic. Yeah, I think you got to store it wherever it makes sense, though, right? I rod and you so you don't drink, uh, because it's mostly expensive. It is expensive. For sure, it's expensive. Let's just sell all this kale. Parsnips. All that. Now let's go find Emily. Yes. Things you say at parties. Yeah, it's a thing you can definitely say at parties. I don't know why I hoed all of this. Also, let me just, I'm going to pause for a second. I just want to look, does having this here look nice? Not really. So I'm going to move, I'm going to move my camera down. Where's my camera? Camera with border. I'm going to move you down here. This here. Or maybe the, let's do this. Let's do this. This is less in the way. I'm going to put my, there we go. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Moving everything around. I just want this to look pretty for you all. All right, Emily, are you at the bar? Yes. Do I still have an orange on me? Yes, I can give Gus an orange. He loves oranges. In case you didn't know. And I have a gold star orange. Yeah, you're giving this to me? I'm speechless. All right, Emily, you got your apricot. Oh, you followed through. Thanks, this looks delicious. 600 gold for a single apricot. That's amazing. Do you raise sheep in your barn? You can turn their wool into beautiful bolts of cloth. I need to upgrade my barn. Oh, right, that's something I was saving up for before I just bought all of it. Oh, forgetful. All right, I'm going up to Robin's place to give some sashimi to my future husband. Hey, Carolyn. Today I'm just going to relax and think positively. Do you ever take a day off? Yes, and it's important to spend some time relaxing and thinking positively. And that comes to another thing that we can do to combat climate doomism and just sadness is have sources of meaning in your life, build connection with people. All of that will help us 
build greater resilience because the more resilient we are in our daily lives, oh yes, future husbands, don't leave. Having a good weekend? Nice. I'm giving you sashimi. Yeah, big heart. I really love this. How did you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Will we do that next Tuesday? Do gin and tequila? Might be. It's good to take a break from work every now and then. It's true. Guess that's kind of difficult when you live on a farm though. Hey, at least in winter you don't have to worry about crops. If only, if only. Hey Robin, my husband almost set the house on fire last night with his science experiment. One of the breakers exploded and sent a fireball into the rafters. Thank you, but I used fire resistant lacquer when I built the place. Well, damn. Oh, not talking about climate change, June. I mean, I try to make sure that whenever I'm talking about these stressful things, I'm also talking about solutions because uh, it's important because I don't want everyone to just become depressed. And I want to talk about it from a consent issue in the sense of like, how do we build more community resilience? How do we talk about community autonomy? And so all of that's important. Um, but if there's a different, okay, uh, if there's a different topic you'd really like to talk about, Ice Bunny, please let me know. Uh, I can always just tell you all about my cats. We can talk about other topics. We can read different articles together. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of many weeks talking about how one of the ways we're going to make a better future is to have better, more meaningful parties and festivals. Uh, anyway, Reverend Mart Sebastian is my future husband because I'm Ariel from The Little Mermaid. And Sebastian is the name of one of the characters. Also, Sebastian's cool. I mean... Everybody in this game is kind of equally interesting to me. If I were really to pick the most interesting person in terms of like who I would probably want to date, Leah or Abigail would probably be my choices. Um, quirky, artsy, kind of into the occult, kind of into nature. Yeah, Elliot could be cool if he weren't so pompous and self-obsessed. Because I do like a writer, all of that, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> it's not my self image. I do not particularly relate to Ariel. Even as a child, I thought Ariel was weird. He was like, why would you want to leave the ocean? You're a mermaid. That's amazing. Abigail says, oh, man, I've been pushing off homework all weekend. Looks like I'll be playing another all-nighter. Good luck, girl. Yeah, I don't know what Disney princess I relate to the most. I don't really think about it because to be honest I don't like Disney as much as you might think I've only named these things related to Disney because you can make some good puns and it's kind of silly but like also in my one of my games of Elden Ring I'm Shriek and then one of my friends is Donkey and Charlie is I think Cat in Shoes <laughs> um, and I don't like Shrek that much so you know yes i like this fishing game it's so many fish what else do i need for the community center goat milk or wool yeah so the next big thing here is i need to get a bigger barn. Okay, fried egg. A pig would help with truffles, fiddlehead ferns, maki roll. Okay, what else? Duck feathers. I have ducks, but I don't think I've got any duck feathers yet. Rabbit's foot. 
none of that. The vault, 25,000 gold. If I can go to the skull mines, oh my goodness, wood skip, sturgeon. So I need a lake fish and wood skip. We looked up. <laughs> Shriek. No, I spelled Shrek with just like a ton of E's, but I appreciate that you know obscure Spider Man villains. Uh, yeah. Okay. Not quite done with the community center yet. I gotta remember that I need to save up money to build a bigger barn so that I can get goats and sheep and pigs so I can make progress and all these things. Help revitalize the community. Give back. Halibut. Uh, Reverend Mort. Oh, yeah, and more inventory. I agree, Rodden. Remember, also the topic of completely unrelated topics as someone who first saw you on a tabletop RPG stream. Any fun stories of your personal experience with RPGing? I mean, I just love RPGing. I don't know if I have good, fun stories because mostly it was just all like, I loved doing it and it was amazing and we had lots of fun together. Uh, but I'll try to think of some, because I do like to talk about it. Um, the first time I ever met Anna, so when I first started streaming, I didn't know any of these people, right? It was just because somebody retweeted some tweets I made about Shadowrun, and then I got invited to join, and it was very, very random, and I didn't know what to expect, and... It was great. I'm glad I did it. For sure. For sure. For sure. Um, but the first time I met Anna, it was at somebody's house. I didn't know if I was going to get, like, murdered going to this house. Just, like, strangers I didn't know. And it was, like, kind of in the sort of suburbs of Seattle where I'd never been. And I was trying to ask about, like, in-game conflict. Like, were we as a team interested in having character to character conflict were we okay with that or were we the kind of group was this the kind of group since they all knew each other that uh was interested in really having everything in game be really like cute and fluffy and like we never fight with each other or like are they comfortable with people who sort of like how much into my character can I be are you comfortable with me making decisions that maybe are not good for the whole group on our quest because they're in line with my character. So I asked about conflict and Anna completely thought that I was talking about interpersonal conflict, not in game conflict. Um, and it was confusing the answer in the first like 10 times where I hung out with all these people, they all exclusively talked about drama from the previous studio they were all a part of and I didn't know any of those people or know any of what they were talking about <laughs> so that was my introduction to this group and I was just like oh okay I'm excited to wear costumes and be silly with you so I will humor these kind of weird experiences um yes it was that one dude it was that one dude and some of the people from that group I still really like. There are other people from that group that I had, unfortunately, really major conflicts with, and I don't talk to them anymore. <laughs> I would say 90% of them are lovely. Some of them became really good friends. Some of them have become like, we appreciate each other from a distance. And there are two that I don't talk to anymore um, for many reasons. Anyway, I'm gonna go to sleep for the night. It's just after six. I do need to go now, uh, so we got one day in, <laughs> but look at how much money I made, almost eight grand, <laughs> amazing, so I'm probably going to be able to afford to buy that barn fast. Uh, most of that money definitely came from this wine, a certain amount came from the kale, which is pretty good, so it wasn't a bad investment to buy a bunch more. Uh, 
I only sold one parsnip. That's fine. Um, that's fine. So I'm going to go now because I got to run some errands and get ready before my brother uh, gets here. And um, yeah, it was lovely to hang out with you all today. Thank you for joining me for one day. It's worth of Stardew Valley. And I will not be here this Sunday um, because I'm going to be teaching an in-person event. Thankfully, it's outdoors and masked and everybody has to take PCR tests beforehand or multiple rapid tests throughout the event. And uh, yeah, um, I will be back next Tuesday. This Sunday, I hope that it will be Ash streaming and maybe Ash and Sar can talk about some more things to do with relationship agreements. Um, please tune in for Ash uh, as well. Give her lots of love and support like you all wonderfully do for me. If you are new to watching this, consider giving us a follow or a subscription. If you want to check out exclusive content, you can check us out on Patreon. We also got a lot of classes coming up this Tuesday, this evening, today. We have the last class in our relationship skills series about how to set and respect boundaries. Um, this Saturday, we have a class on consent and accountability. And then on Sunday, we have a consent support group for people who are non-binary. Um, next week, what do we got going on next week? We have a class on Wednesday uh, called Beyond the Ban and its strategies for community accountability beyond just banning people. But that's all we got going on next week. Um, and then we have a lot coming up later in September. So feel free to check out our schedule, check out our classes. Um, I'll put the website and Patreon if you wanna check these things out. And I think socials was what I wrote. Yeah, check out our social media, follow us on whatever you like. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye.